Back, ladies and gentlemen, to Deep Thoughts. Today we're going to talk about chemtrails again. I made an episode in season one that's entitled, Are Chemtrails Real? And what I'm going to do in this particular episode is edit together some of my personal photographs of chemtrails to show you why they are very real. So if you're coming in on audio and this is something that interests you, then please get over to YouTube and just search on Deep Thoughts Radio and you'll see my ugly mug, and uh, I wear sunglasses just in case, and it's in black and white if you haven't been over ever. I watched a live broadcast from someone I admire, and it was sort of shocking to see that this person had started off understanding a lot of things about the world, and that it would seem that they have completely gone down the path of joining them so that he doesn't have to wake up in the morning with any imperative in his life. And it is, it's saddening to me. I've got an episode I recorded, which I don't know if it's going to be out. It's a season three thing. I keep in season three looking pretty much like season two. I'm going to redo this intro. So I haven't even gotten to the point where I've done the, redone the intro or anything. Uh, again, I'm going to swap the music at least. But he went on and on and on about how anyone who believes that a lot of things in life are conspiratorial, meaning, you know, one or two people conspiring against others, he essentially just sat on this live broadcast and just one by one told the world that there are no conspiracies in the world and nothing to worry about and... There's a lot of them I can get behind him a little bit on, uh, but uh, Kim Trolls is one that I thought was shockingly in his portfolio. And then the funny thing is, is he'll say, you know, I have been researching this for four years and therefore I completely fucking know what these things are and I've, I've done this and that and this. And, you know, I've been researching this for, you know, I would say researching and taking photographs and interviewing pilots for nine years. At no point did anyone ever shake up my belief that these things are real. And now we actually have the director of the CIA, we have NASA, and we have other organizations all coming out saying that a geoengineering program is being launched. It is now starting, and it's going to be spraying this reflective shield in the sky to bounce back the sunlight to help fight global warming. So that's in the press today. National normal press, okay? Not fake news press. I mean, they're all fucking fake, but whatever. And so, you know, we've had the government of Germany admit that they they have an aerosol program. They said it was an experimental um, military weapon. I have lots of friends in China who are indigenous Chinese people and domestic American expats that live over there for manufacturing reasons. Uh, they have said, look, we've watched, you know, Chinese government has admitted manipulating the weather for the Olympics, which created a monsoon that killed like 75 people, which probably means about 750. And so what blows my mind is that anyone would ever say that an aerosol program doesn't exist when it's been completely declassified. When geoengineers meet at conferences and discuss the entire application and use of these, plus the chemical compounds that are being sprayed out of these jets that we have, you know, picked up out of the sky. Now, what might be bullshit are spinoff theories like Morgellons. Who knows, right? We won't be talking about that on this episode. So before we totally go into all the photographs, I just want to say a little bit in the metaphysics of why people cowered down. If you feel hopeless and incapable of actually imposing change on the areas of the world that you can't control, right? If someone said your water supply is fluoridated, you should get fluoride out of your water, 
couple hundred bucks and your kitchen is secure for the rest of your, you know, for 10,000 gallons, you know, and you can just keep replacing the filter. You can put them in your showers. You can put them on the main line of your house. So you can clean up the water. As frustrating as that is, you still have a mechanism to make it better. If someone proves to you how bad pharmaceuticals are and GMO foods and fast foods and all that stuff, you can simply stop eating it and stop taking the vaccinations and stop going to the hospital and get murdered by an oncologist, right? Okay. But the sky is a very special thing that we cannot easily control. Dr. Russell Blaylock has taken samples of this stuff being spread out of the back of planes, and it's nano-sized machine-made versions of aluminum, barium oxide, uh, strontium, which is an isotope straight out of a nuclear reactor. And again, the, uh, the strontium could be picked up out of the atmosphere if things like Fukushima are real, if things like uh, Chernobyl are real. The stuff gets just pushed in the sky, and when you grab stuff out of the sky, you're simply grabbing minute amounts of stuff that's been put up there, right? So I understand if someone is, they look in the mirror and they go, look, I'm willing to do anything to make the world a safer place for myself, for my wife, for my children, or for my husband, or whatever. And when it comes to the sky being polluted, what the fuck can you do, you know? You buy a bunch of... uh, JDAM rockets and, you know, what is it, uh, the, the tow missile or whatever, thing you can shoot off your shoulder to knock planes out of the fucking sky. You can't do that. So you have to either stay inside when it's happening or figure out a way that through exposure of the conspiracy that we get the world to wake up and say no more planes are allowed in the sky if they can't fly from point A to point B without creating some sort of trail that's, that's more indicative of a contrail, Right. But what happens when a conspiracy gets revealed? Well, initially, the the government agency that's doing it, which could be deep state, could be some sort of shadow government, which is the same thing, they're doing it through some weird lie that gets the government to do it to themselves, right? Most of our stuff, I believe, comes out of San Bernardino or San Diego. Uh, I live in Huntington Beach, so when I see all of the trails coming out of the desert over... Orange County, they're all vectored back to San Bernardino, which is a very, very heavily protected base. I've got family that have worked at that base, and, you know, again, you get in a black bus and you're fucking driven around for 30 minutes uh, to try to obfuscate where you are. You you get a bunch of turns and stuff, and you can't figure out where you are. It's a different path every day, and there's a lot of secrecy up there for some reason. So where does someone draw the line between they're real and they're not real? Because... As soon as a conspiracy is revealed, the, uh, for lack of a better agency, the chief agency is the Army Corps of PSYOPs. They have over a billion dollars a year in funding. I think it's nearly $2 billion now. And they have a bunch of spinoff consulting agencies that also contribute to PR spinning, uh, dreaming up ideas to to dilute the evidence so that you can't find it, to give people who are going into the cowardice phase of their life all these scientific explanations as to why this occurs all of a sudden. Now, the problem is, is that if you are uh, in your late 20s or or early 30s and below age-wise, then you will know nothing else besides chemtrails. You will think that planes make clouds. That, That, you know, this chemical condensation between temperatures that creates an ice trail behind a plane somehow expands and creates a natural seeding that makes clouds. Vaporous clouds that take on no hue of gray because they do not absorb, they're not made of moisture for one thing, and they reflect light like a mother. So they're pure white crystal bags of stuff floating in the sky. Again, Los Angeles, California, and Orange County, and Ventura County are very intense targets for this because we have a massive population around here. But it also happens in the Midwest of my hometown. Right? And I've also tracked this on a GMO Monsanto level in my hometown where for 150 years my hometown was able to grow soybeans and corn infinitely and hay. And if we don't do wheat in my hometown that wheat's further east or further west, excuse me, in Kansas. We're in the southeast corner. And it, they sprayed the shit out of my hometown. All the crops failed for four years straight. And Monsanto showed up with an aluminum oxide resistant plant and all of a sudden everyone had a really amazing crop and they got to spray glyphosate 
which is Roundup, all over the crops, which then soaks into the fucking food, which then gets distributed to the world. And now, not only are you eating a GMO-terminated gene sequence, but you're eating glyphosate. When I was back from my reunion a few years back, um, it was pathetic. There was a whole armada of jets flying this grid over my hometown. It's like, we don't have any international airport near my town. My town's 100 miles away from the nearest domestic or international airport. I should have said domestic. So no one flies over my hometown ever. Never has. But now they fly between 10,000 feet and 20,000 feet. I mean, the planes are massive in the sky, dumping this shit out. But they think that everyone from the Midwest is so stupid, they can get really blatant like they used to do in California. My concern is that they have found a way to apply so much pressure that good soldiers of the world are caving in and joining them. You know, it's one thing for you to sit in your living room and go, well, well maybe these things aren't what they say they are. Maybe Jesse Ventura's big giant vagina is right. That there's no reason to fight back. Because, you know, if these things were real, then uh, they wouldn't spray them over Washington, D.C. They wouldn't spray them over all the politicians. Because why would the politicians allow this to happen? It's like, what politician besides Trump is not a massive fucking pussy? You mean to tell me that Obama gave you any fucking inkling that he was a man? He let country after country threaten us and he just kept moving the line back. You know, Bush wasn't any better. So we need some grown-ups in this fucking world that don't cower down. You can take a break all you want. But if you sit at your house and you start joining them or you start, you know, just saying, man, I can't figure out what the fuck these things are. You know, what, is it Faraday and Tesla both knew that ether existed and they both gave up on trying to figure out exactly what it was, but they didn't subtract it from their fucking equations. Tesla's whole thing was based on something that he couldn't figure out what it was, but he said it's there. So at a minimum, you need to hang on to logic and understand that just because you can quote scientific process and read it out of some fucking Wikipedia page and feel smart, uh, if you don't apply it to your life and the problems of this world, then uh, you're just blowing smoke up your ass. You're fucking Neil deGrasse Tyson 2.0 and you're useless. To humanity. So there used to be another show called MK Ultra Radio. It's gone now. But during that particular show, uh, my partner and I, Kyle, we went out and and uh, my co-host, I should say, I got to be careful using the word partner in this world. My co-host, we conducted uh, as many interviews as we possibly could with pilots with anywhere from uh, a few thousand hours of experience to 20,000 hours experience. We, we interviewed commercial pilots, private pilots, and military pilots. Unequivocally, they said, it, it's not us, man. It's not our flights. Our flights do not make these fucking things. As a matter of fact, uh, one of them talked to us about the fact that they have to take a class in aviation school that is directly related to contrails and how they create and the, the gotchas with flying behind other jets, uh, if, if it's a real high condensation atmosphere, I fall on that particular day because it's really cold. And he says, at no point in the educational process of contrails did they ever fucking mention this latest invention of persistent contrails. So how do you figure? How do you figure with all the education from the 80s, clear up into the 21st century, contrail training never ever talked about persistent contrails. They don't need to tell you something that your plane never does, right? One of the pilots I interviewed has about 10,000 hours, and he said, uh, when I was really young and started flying, he says I would, uh, one of the events that really took place in his life was that he pointed over to a plane that was shooting a trail way below them. He goes, we're at 35,000 feet, and this thing's at like 20, and it's shooting this fucking trail. And I said, hey, he's a co-pilot. And he goes, what do you, what's that? And he's flying in a normal commercial jet as a co-pilot. And he said that the pilot, who was in his uh, 40s or whatever, maybe early 50s, said, you know, we don't talk about those planes. Oh, because they don't exist, right? Mm -hmm. Later on, about 10 years later, as he's flying a G5 back from South America, he has a plane that he can see in the sky that is uh, getting really close to his plane. And it's seemingly has this 
soot coming out the back. And it's so intense that you can see it at nighttime because it was, the moon was out and it was flashing on all the clouds from above, and he could see it. And he calls down to ground control and says, uh, I got this plane off to my right, and it's not showing up on my radar. There's no friend or foe indicator. What is this thing? No reply back from ground control. The plane turns off its lights, goes, uh, you know, speeds up, and goes about 100, uh, I guess, aeronautical miles ahead of him. And then it... it uh, as he has adjusted his vector to land at the airport here in Los Angeles, he gets behind the thing. He gets a uh, call back that simply says the following. He's out of your way now. And the lights had come back on, and now they're flying in the wake of the trail. They could have changed altitudes, and he's coming down for the landing. So they're kind of crossing each other's paths. And he says he'd never seen anything like it in his life. At no point does he ever, has he ever flown in the path of a smoke trail coming out of a plane. Never even seen it besides the couple times he mentioned it to his, his uh, superiors, who then told him to shut up. And let's keep track of how the conversation went, because I didn't recall that for you guys in this episode. I never mentioned contrails, or chemtrails, excuse me, to him before I had him deduce that that's what was going on. So I didn't seed his brain with the concept and have him repeat it back. As a matter of fact, he had never heard of the theory of chemtrails. He had just seen these things and wondered what the hell they were. And the funny thing was, even after the interview, which lasted an hour, he didn't uh, really seem to have any interest in in looking at it. But then again, you know, he may have metabolized an interest over time. The fighter pilot, the retired fighter fighter pilot that my my co-host interviewed, just kept saying over and over and over again, they exist, but they're not us. They're not anything commercial. They're not us. Uh, the other commercial pilot that had 20,000 hours and it was just about to retire, he said the same thing. And it was interesting. These two people don't know each other, but both of them said, it's not us. Isn't that remarkable? So, I think I'm going to title this, Chemtrails Are Real. When I used to take photographs of chemtrails, it started in 2008. And what's very fascinating about this is that if you started in 2008, you saw the evolution on how these things are sprayed. It used to be really blatant. And I'm going to start showing some photographs of my, uh, my neighborhood here as it was gridded back in the day. Absolutely gridded. They still shoot massive lines from time to time. But again, with all these pussies coming out saying it doesn't exist, they can go back to these blatant techniques because the, dis- the disinformation is now infiltrated people that were fighting the war to get rid of these things, right? And now they're like, hey, stupidity is multiplying. We've got evangelists for the fucking, you know, death of mankind. Isn't this great? But now they spray in special techniques. They even spray multiple planes side by side to create big giant blankets of this stuff. The trail almost combines immediately, right? A buddy of mine is a uh, former flight attendant. I took him out on a day. We just happened to walk out of his house on a day here in Orange County, and the sky was fucking plastered with these things. But it's all coming back, you know, coming in from a vector over in San Bernardino base. And I looked at him, and I, because he's he's not, he doesn't follow conspiracies at all, and he knows that I've talked about chemtrails a little bit, and he's been in, you know, thousands and thousands of flights in his lifetime. And I said, look at those trails right there. I said, does that match the the uh you know the highways up there does this look anything like the landing path of of any of the bases or sorry to the airports that you know of because we got john wayne to the south we got long beach to the north and 30 minutes north we've got lax i said if all planes create these things on a particular day because the weather's a certain way then every plane should be doing it and we should just see the corridors up there in the in the sky it should be literally look like a tyco uh race car set in, in space, right? Right above our head. But it's not that way. On days that this shit happens, just stand out there for 30 minutes to an hour and keep looking for everything that's flying over your head. And the funny thing is, is that a bunch of planes will be at varying altitudes. And you just take your camera and or take your eyeballs. It's better if you have a, a zoom camera. And you'll notice that the size of the plane determines its, its uh, altitude. And you'll find planes exactly the same size as other planes that, are, that aren't farting out a single contrail particle, let alone 
these persistent contrails, right? Because I'm surrounded 10 minutes to my south, in fact, it's not even that, like eight minutes to the south, I got uh, John Wayne Airport. Uh, about 10 minutes to my north, I have Long Beach. I got Long Beach flights that fly over and land. For those of you who listen to the show, you're for 200 episodes, every time you hear a flight flying over, not a helicopter, but a flight, it's going to Long Beach. And so I've got a corridor right over my house. Boom, boom, boom. So the day that everything is all packed up there, I've got planes coming in all day long. And they circle out there in the ocean and come in. A lot of them. And some planes are dumping out. And and the funny thing is, is like, I've got photographs of C-130s dumping out four massive trails out of one plane. Unbelievably massive trails coming out of the back of these planes. And it's summertime. The ocean itself is uh, 75 to 80 degrees. The water, which takes a lot of heat. And I guarantee you, when it's 100 degrees outside, the thermals up there are uh, much warmer than they are in the wintertime. And yet the sky will fill up on a particular day. But again, plane after plane flies by these trails. And they're not cranking out anything. The other thing is, when you grew up in the Midwest, planes and jets are very mysterious and especially in the 70s and 80s when I grew up there every time I saw a jet fly over it was a big deal as a kid you'd point you'd look you'd stare and you'd always see the little contrail in the middle of the winter which is this little tiny trail behind the plane and when I went back from my reunion in the middle of summer when again it was 100 plus degrees out every single day I was there the sky is filling up with these low altitude planes and why do I know they're low altitude well they're a shitload bigger than the ones that are cruising over at 30,000 feet because I'm sitting there and there was a 30,000 footer up there putting out a little trail a little tiny contrail and these other things they're big giant thick cotton clouds right these things that are being sprayed out of these uh, chemtrail planes and that can only be achieved through low altitude to, to look so massive in the sky right but now here's where we get to the point where we can start cutting through the bullshit of them being fake or real and I'm going to use photos to prove this to you Chemtrails fly in very intelligent patterns. When they are spraying this stuff on us, they are spraying it in geometric shapes. And, you know, there's a lot of theories about why they do this. But one thing that they do is they will shoot a line in the sky. And, you you know, again, your, your person that doesn't want to believe, your joiner uh, of the dark side, they'll say, see, that's just a, that's just a persistent contrail. Then another plane flies up against that trail and turns off the sprayer. They fly a trail directly to it perpendicular and turn off their sprayer and continue flying. So now you have a T in the sky. That is not going to happen. That is not going to happen if it's an organic thing that's happening simply because of the conditions in the atmosphere. Uh, We've got T, what we call T-bars. We've got Z's where two lines are sprayed and someone comes in between and turns on the sprayer when they hit the first bar and turns off the sprayer when they hit the second bar. We have people that are planes that turn off their sprayers in mid-flight. And they are hard stops. You're going to see a photograph of a hard stop just right over my, my house. And it's a square on the end. It's not a tapered, uh, you know... Hey, I went inside of a pocket of moisture and I created this trail and then all of a sudden I'm out of the pocket of moisture. No. And it's super, super low to the ground. The other huge thing is that when I uh, used to run my old video game company, I had uh, several employees coming to work every day. Both, I had a north office and a south office. And at one point we got up to about 30 employees, about a third of them here in Orange County and two thirds of them up in uh, L.A., And I was obsessed with taking photographs of these things. I've got thousands and thousands of photographs. And when I finally got my 50X zoom with the 50X uh, digital zoom, I was able to start taking photographs of planes, you know, and getting the pictures of their uh, vertical stabilizers. And I would come inside because when you get into this, you get infuriated pretty quickly if you're new to this, right? And that's why people cower down and join this dark movement because it is infuriating because you can't control your air very easily. What are you going to do? Put a, uh, an oxygen scrubber inside your house so that all the oxygen goes in your house is like some nuclear fallout shelter? No. You know? 
But what happens here is that they spray on a particular day. Fill up the sky. Unbelievable. And again, doesn't match any of the flight corridors of commercial flights. Uh, I believe I've got photographs of what looks like a Southwest airline flight doing it, which they have the very patented orange and kind of purplish blue paint job. And But there's no markings on the back, like it's a taxi cab that's still yellow, but they've painted out, you know, yellow cabs logos. It's like an old cop car where they, it's like the Blues Brothers cop car where they've painted out all of the, um, you know, police enforcement logos, uh, but you can buy the car with this, the base coloring, right? But what happens is my, I would come inside and it, there was a point where I would sort of mention these to my employees or I'd say happy chemtrail day when I walk in the door and they would laugh. And I told them, I said, uh, you know, make sure you take your vitamins, make sure you eat right because everyone's going to get sick in this office about three days from now, two to three days from now. And they'd laugh two to three days later. Both my north office and south office would come down with massive colds, flus, whatever is going around, right? And I'm sitting back going, Jesus Christ, you know, how many times do I got to predict they're going to get all sick at the same fucking time before they just start, sort of go, well, what are you? Are you the guy bringing some, you know, pathogen into the office or something? Or is it coming from somewhere else? And I wouldn't tell them every single time. It's not like I'm programming their brains to get sick. But it always happened. Like I've said several times on the show, I've got friends of mine in Hollywood that uh, contribute heavily to all things film and television, and a lot of them are hermits. They don't go out. And when I mean they don't go out, they buy all their food, they stay in their house, they go in their backyard, they mess around, they have their hobbies, they don't take walks, they don't go down to restaurants and eat, they don't let anyone come to the door besides maybe a UPS guy dropping off a package. And they come down with the exact same ailments as everyone else. The other huge indicator that these things are being done intentionally, and this is what one of my interviews revealed, was that, because uh, one of the pilots had actually been watching this for a long time, and I think he was, he was very relieved to have a conversation with someone for the first time in his life where he could just talk about it and he wasn't being treated like he was a crazy person. But he said he was the one that really locked down for me personally that these things are being shot between 10 and 20,000 feet because he said, look, when we're approaching our cruising altitude, he goes, we have to go through these things. So he goes, I know specifically where that zone is. And then he said, he goes, look, pretty much between 10,000 and 30,000 is a restricted military airspace. You know, like the, your biplanes are all, or sorry, your, your, you know, prop engine planes are all down below that. And, you know, private jets go up to 40,000, 45,000 feet. But the one thing that he stressed that he argued with, I guess, with some of his co-pilots uh, over the years was that they seem to cross the same airspace within seconds, which allows them to shoot these T's uh, where, you know, there's one line that goes over the other. Or they shoot these figure A's uh, in the sky. These big giant letter A's. And he said it's it's not permitted to do that because it's not safe. You can't share airspace like that because some idiot's going to run into another plane. You can't have close calls and not and get away with it, basically. Every time a plane gets close to another plane in the sky, it's typically harvested and reported. And then the news every once in a while, when the news is slow, will pick it up and report a near collision in the sky, right? Again, uh, I'll repeat an experience. I'll try to find the photographs, but I was filming a group of planes that was coming out of San Diego, flying up the coast of LA, dropping these massive trails. I mean, massive trails, meaning probably uh, a good 100 to 200 mile long trails. And then I kept filming them going from south to north, south to north. And our coast is actually diagonal, so it goes in a direction, kind of goes from southeast to northwest. And then I'm filming, you know, I'm taking these photographs, and then all of a sudden, a, uh, a, the same plane with the same markings on the back that had flown up earlier was coming back south along the border, I would assume to go back to where it came from, and it had no trail. While its cousin, with the same exact weird markings on the back, was cutting a massive trail. And again, for your people who cowered down and try to whitewash this whole thing, 
that doesn't make any sense. If the atmosphere is creating this condition, it will create that condition for every single plane that has a heated turbine. It really doesn't matter what fuel you use, right? Anytime something gains a certain uh, speed, it has friction. And the faster it moves, the more friction it happens, right? It's very difficult to shoot out, you know, cold air, right? That's why we have air conditioners, right? We have to uh, metabolize the air so it's super duper cold at its source and it's heating up the whole way as it goes out. But a turbine is always hot as hell. Now, I want to say that uh, in trying to uncover the conspiracy of chemtrails, there, we inadvertently probably created some, some untrue facts about when they started. And it has to do with the fact that when society, when a section of society wakes up to a conspiracy, they will typically record that the conspiracy started when they personally woke up. And it's, it's part of what keeps people up at night when they wake up to how the world is actually being manipulated by all the banking institutions and obviously their subsidiary corporations and military industrial complexes, right? Because you wake up and you say, oh my God, look at how the military does this and does that. And, you know, especially like not taking care of our wounded soldiers. That seems like something that's recently come out to the, you know, in America as the VAs, but you go, you go back in time and it has been happening forever. The second your country has used you up as a soldier, and I mean all European countries, America, they typically won't take care of the vets. They're done with you. You you serve the petrol dollar, right? Luckily that's changing in a huge way this year. So the back to chemtrails. The first group that really put a, millions of dollars into researching this was the group in Santa Fe that I mentioned in the other episode. A bunch of really eccentric, brilliant, creative people who can see things that other people can't see because they're creative started, you know, they're trying to paint the vistas in uh, New Mexico. And there's this huge armada of planes spraying the desert. And you would only assume it's a test because what the hell could they be doing? They can't really affect much of the population and they can't, uh, they're not really affecting any crops. There's nothing growing out there. So they must have just been messing around. So they called the Air Force and said, look, could you guys lighten up a little bit? Because we're trying to, we live out here and we're trying to paint the vistas and you guys are blotting out the sun, which completely affects the color palette of what we're trying to do here. You know, could you at least let us know when you're going to do these maneuver so we won't waste our time driving 100 miles out to a vista to paint gray and the air force told them we're not doing anything those things don't exist so at that point you have you know military branch telling human beings they're not seeing something that they're seeing they have pictures of well they were the first group that went up and got a samples of this stuff and that's where you got the barium oxide aluminum oxide and fibers with desiccated red blood cells in them now, again, a bunch of that could be, uh, although I've seen the interviews with the guy that did this and, and, you know, everyone could be a shill, everyone could be a liar. You know, if they want to create this big distrust of government thing, right? But enough people have gone up that are angry and paid for research. People have contributed their time to researching this stuff. But what happened was, is that the the overall story was that these things started in the late 90s because that's when this group who put a lot of effort into it started noticing them and they said that well the few years before living in new mexico they were always able to paint the vistas without any any you know significant visual interruption right but now i've watched a bunch of movies that actually have trails in them now there's a rumor that I will not substantiate, but there's rumors that old movies are having them inserted in them because they've got a way to get, because everything's digitally transmitted now for Netflix and that kind of thing, or they're able to repress DVDs and remaster them, and they're putting in chemtrails. Uh, I have not seen any significant proof that that's the case, but I've said, uh, like I've said before, we have them, why don't we have them inserted into CG movies for kids? And why the fuck would you do that? The Turbo Snail movie, massive chemtrails in the first act. The Lego movie, um, 
massive chemtrails. Why would you put them in there? Why would you put them in there? You have to understand people. You know, I work with effect studios. And when we, if a director sits over an animator's shoulder and says, put this in, you, there's a, somewhere the executive producer is hearing the money clink out of their account into the special effects studios account. So everything you put in these films, you have to pay for. And if it's not critical to the story, why the fuck put it in there? Because you're paying for it. You know, it's not the most difficult thing to do, especially the turbo snail thing. There's these, you know, particle uh, systems that you, you know, someone dials in, just literally select this, and it makes a cloud thing pop out, and so you can have, uh, you know, model a plane, make a particle system right at the back end of the plane or at the engines or whatever, and they fly over. It sure seems like someone's trying to brainwash kids into thinking these things are real. But now here's the funny one. You look at most of the productions out of the BBC. It's almost as if there is a conscious effort by all the cinematic directors, uh, the the directors, or the, sorry, the, yeah, the directors of the shows, to film as much chemtrail activity as possible in all their episodes. I think all the comedies of the BBC, uh, you know, IT Crowd, and uh, a bunch of these shows. And there's chemtrails packed in the sky. It is unbelievable. Uh, Reno 911 here in America, tons of trails in the sky. But go watch something like Keeping Up Appearances, which is a BBC show made in the late 80s, early 90s. There's no chemtrails in the shots. None. Right now, if you watch the Muppet movie made in 1979, as I've said before in previous episodes, there's a scene where Fozzie Bear and Kermit the Frog are headed to California and they pass Big Bird walking down the street uh, on an old country road. And there's a chemtrail from coast to coast, from like one horizon to the other. Massive. I don't know if that's in the uh, original VHS tape from the early 80s. If you've got that movie, go back and watch it for me. If you got a kid's copy or something. I had a buddy of mine who's a massive Muppet fan, and I said, could you please watch this back for me and see if it's in there? And he didn't have an old copy anymore. Three Amigos, directed by Mr. John Landis. The opening credits are shot uh, against the desert as they're kind of walking, on, you know, riding in on these horses, and the trails are all in the sky in the back. But it's a desert where they do, you know, a lot of military, uh, you know, pilot training. So when you have a jet that's doing afterburners, you will get an amazing trail out of the back of a jet when it's engaging these, uh, you know, super high velocity states of the engine, right? So I've seen him in old movies. The artist known as Prince did an interview on the BET, the Black Entertainment uh, Network. I guess it's Black Entertainment Television or something like that. It's famous. You look up Prince, Kim Trails, and you can watch him do an interview where he talks about how when he was in Minneapolis, Minnesota, these chemtrails, uh, and he got this from um, Dick Gregory, one of his advisors. Dick's a little nuts nowadays, but uh, about 10, 15 years ago, Dick Gregory was actually pretty phenomenal, but I think he's been used uh, as a tool to disseminate information that wasn't true, but then he tries to undo what he did. But Prince said, look, when I was a kid, these trails would go spraying over our neighborhood. And he goes, about 30 minutes later, every, you could just hear the neighborhood start arguing and getting really angry at each other. And he goes, people would just lose their minds a little bit. That was in the late 60s, early 70s. Prince was born in 1958. So that takes it way back. So let's talk about the, the mainstream press that's talking about geoengineering chemtrails, literally, chemical trails that are going to be sprayed in the sky, they call it an aerosol program, to create a reflective shield of particles that will reflect the sun's light and keep us from suffering from global warming. Well, for any of you who have done your real research on global warming, you'll know it's nothing more than a carbon taxation population control uh, problem, right? So they want to create carbon taxation so it costs too much to live and you will not... M multiply because you have to pay for every child until they get to 18 and get their own allocation. So global warming 
as the what is the head meteorologist professor at MIT 10 years ago said, you know, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is 0.054% in the greenhouse gas layer, which means there's no CO2 at all. It's infinitesimally nothing, 540th of a single percent. All right. So what are you, what are you uh, protecting us against? So the idea that the governments are now saying, we're going to be spraying this in the sky to defend you against something that's not a problem, means they're spraying something in the sky for a different reason, okay? But okay, let's say that you and I start a little, uh, start a little company where we're going to service this objective of creating a shield in the sky to protect the entire fucking planet from every ray of sun that comes down. Okay. So let's do a little bit of basic science, shall we? Before we really get into this bullshit. Because again, this is normal news, right? What's the hottest part of the, uh, the world? The equator, right? And again, in the heliocentric model... They say that regardless of the tip and the rotation, you know, even though the, the sun is 93 million miles away, uh, its sun rays are actually hitting us parallel. And that their big excuse why the equator is hotter than the north and the south is because uh, somehow the curvature of the earth focuses the beams down and fries the center of the earth more than it fries the north and the south, which is complete and utter horseshit, right? But you would want to spray the equator more than anything else in the world, right? Because that's where it gets hottest. But now I want you to think about this. Think about how teeny tiny a human being slash a big jumbo jet is in the world. How big is it? It's got the whole world 8,000 miles roughly in diameter, right? The circumference is 24,000 miles around. Now let's take that into a three-dimensional sphere. How many cubic miles do you think are in the world's atmosphere. I don't have it on me right now, but I'll tell you what, it's a fuck ton of cubic miles up there in the sky. And the more that you uh, take elevation, you're expanding infinitesimally, but you're expanding the uh, circumference and the cubic miles even more. So if we were to create a contract agency, we've got a bunch of jets and, you know, they're a bunch of derelict jets that we buy off the, uh, the old fleets from uh, national, you know, brands out there like United and whatever. After we beat everyone up and drag them off the plane. We've got to take the entire interior of the plane, fill it with a bunch of patented aerosol uh, units, which we have got photographs of that and it's filed in the patent office under military designations. And we have got to spray every single square mile of the world completely around, top to bottom, right? Constantly. Constantly, constantly, constantly. With something that's going to be so light, it stays up there in the sky, which is where the theory of the nano-sized aluminum oxide comes into play. When it's really, really tiny, the idea is that you can get it over certain levels of the atmosphere, and it'll stay up there. Hmm. Remember the photographs of the big, thick trails really close to the ground? Remember the testimony from the pilot that says, look, I fly over these things constantly. I flew to Hawaii in 2013, November. Below me, I saw a chemtrail pretty much headed all the way to Hawaii. The Hawaiian citizens are very pissed off about this, by the way. The point I'm trying to make is that it is technically impossible to impact, even if you're willing to fly these things at 60,000 feet, which is where you would have to fly these things to get the particles to sit way up there in the atmosphere, right? It's technically impossible to use the entire world's fleet, kick everyone off the planes, hire United, click, kick everyone off the planes, punch everyone in the face. Now you got every single plane that we've ever built that can do high altitude flying and fill them full of these aerosol dispensing machines and put them up there in the sky. It is impossible to impact the amount of sun rays that hit this planet. It's impossible. The second you spray it, it might clump up, fall down. It hits a rainstorm, falls down. We're not spraying them that high, right? These commercial airlines are not supposed to go much past 40,000 feet in the sky. They're not built to do it. All right. 
so what's this bullshit about them spraying a, a big shield around the earth? It's technically impossible. It is so technically impossible that to even mention that that's a theory or an objective that mankind's going to do, you'd be, you know, it, it would be spraying a shield around earth and building uh, a Dyson sphere around the universe or around the solar system. That's about in the same category of impossibility with the current state of technology that we have today. Why do geoengineering groups exist with aerosol programs as the forefront of their objectives, right? Every research uh, branch of the universe, or, or of our, sorry, of our world, of a university has a focus, right? Their focus is in aerosol programs, the geoengineering part of it. Now, the other side of the coin of the accusations of those that have capitulated down is that somehow there are folks out there that love conspiracies. And, you know, again, if any of you have ever been in like a, you know, a fistfight of some sort, and you've also uh, had a wonderful experience where you're just out, you know, surfing or whatever, and you have you catch a really good wave, the amount of dopamine and adrenaline that dumps into your system when you're riding a wave, that, you know, you're sitting in the ocean you're totally stationary, and then when you hop on a wave, you're going seemingly 25, 30 miles an hour within a second. It's an amazing experience, right? Plus, you're one with nature out there in the ocean. But if you get into some sort of altercation with someone, or you get all wired up, and you're screaming, and you're yelling, and you're pushing around a little bit, and it's all over, you have that same dump of chemicals in your system. And supposedly, okay... The accusation is that for anyone who hangs on to the visual evidence in the sky, like today, there's not a single fucking trail in the sky today, right? Yesterday, packed. Same exact weather. Tomorrow will be the same thing. It'll either be binary. It's either completely fucking packed for all the trails or there's nothing. There's nothing because they sprayed the shit out of us yesterday. I guarantee you, if it's a natural phenomenon, it ain't fucking possible to have the whole sky agree you know, into one, you know, all the multiple layers and the pockets, the air pockets up there and the cold and hot pockets up there, the thermals that come off the land and the, the cold thermals that come off the ocean. In fact, we should be seeing nothing but contrails or, you know, persistent contrails the second they hit the land because they're hitting, uh, or maybe they're over the ocean and then they stop over land because it gets warmer. No, there's no logic to it at all. Either they spray or they don't spray, right? But the idea is that some, some of us are sitting here getting off on this. Or we have such precious fucking egos that we have to um, uh, we have to release videos that have the trend keyword in the title. And what's funny about it is the people that are accusing this shit of all being fake make video after video after video using flat Earth and other fucking conspiracies in every goddamn title of every video. Because what they're really trying to do is get a bunch of friends online. You know, it, it's like this. For anyone who really believes that these things exist because they've done their research, they've taken their photographs, they've applied some logic, they've done ground interviews with people, which I know a lot of people who've done this, all these steps, right? And they're never going to let go. They're never going to let go, man. If, if you said, uh, you know, you could flick a switch on your wall and they disappear forever and you will no longer get any notoriety from chemtrail, photographs, videos, episodes, and... When you flick that switch, everything you've ever done and everything you've ever gained from talking about chemtrails goes away. All of us would go, no fucking problem, flip. We don't give a shit. What we want is the world to be clean, air to be clean. We want this cyclical illnesses that come right after these things are sprayed. Also in the summertime, right? In America, 10 years ago, they coined the summer cold. Because everyone's breathing this particulate, which makes us sick. I'll get to that before we get out of here. This is a little bit of a duplicate of the season one episode, but I'm going at it from a, a really, uh, the standpoint of being a warrior for the world, you know? You got to be one. It's, all gonna, it's only going to stop with global consciousness. It's not going to stop if someone makes the best goddamn video on YouTube. Big deal. Everyone's got to figure this shit out, you know? But the other side of the coin is, if someone said, you got to go up to the biggest volcano you can get your hands on and jump in, and you die, you're dead. I'm sure you might believe in reincarnation, all that kind of stuff, but what you are today will cease to exist. But as a result of that sacrifice, 
chemtrails will go away forever, and nothing will ever replace them. The air will be clean for the rest of humanity. Everyone I know would jump in that volcano in a heartbeat. This ain't some technique to be popular. You know, we're not sawing out videos on YouTube trying to to do fucking clickbait titles and shit, right? So why does it make you sick? Because a lot of people, again, there's, it's easy to disinfo some of the claims because it's like cell phones uh, creating cancer. You know, they, they, they picked out the elements of a cell phone that absolutely do not cause cancer and then said, look how ridiculous this theory is when they ignore the power supply completely, right? There is, and this is something I'm going to repeat probably a couple times in season three here, but there's something called the law of particulates. And that is uh, very easily explained as what we are supposed to be breathing is exactly what our bodies are designed to breathe, which is pure oxygen. There's more to it than just oxygen, but we're supposed to breathe the cleanest oxygen we possibly can, right? That's why people get in these tubes to stay young. Everyone thought Michael Jackson was crazy for getting in one of those... uh, those kind of oxygen lung things. There's a lot of people in Hollywood that do it, and they look pretty good. Apparently, they're not that expensive either. But here's the thing. If your body cannot breathe pure oxygen, then you are malnourished when it comes to oxygenating your blood, which is a very important process for the human body. It allows you to flush out toxins. You know, drinking water is good too. When we have the sky filled with all these chemicals, we are breathing things that are knocking down our immune system. It's knocking down the power supply to the human body because it's got to filter out this particulate. Again, studied Russell Blaylock's videos when it comes to chemtrails because he's done the analysis of nano-sized aluminum. You think the guy fucking made this stuff happen? Do you realize that you can't get nano-sized aluminum easily in the world? You don't go down to Walmart and buy it. You don't go on Amazon and buy a bag of it. The machinery that makes this stuff is typically hoarded within military industrial complexes with the most security you could possibly put on a building, right? And again, we're not sure who the hell is actually doing this, right? It would appear as if military organizations and the Air Force have covert annexed hangars that do it because of the woman that used to do it in uh, Oklahoma and then she moved to Georgia after nine years of helping supply these planes with barium oxide and aluminum oxide coming in from phantom vendors and having the designation of privacy to the point where she wasn't able to to check them in. She had to give them the pass at the door to drive into the base, but she wasn't allowed to ask them, you know, how much do I owe you for this and who are who the fuck are you, right? She said they would move into the base, go to these private hangars, and fill up planes. And I'm sure she's a liar, right? I'm sure she's out there opening for concerts and putting her whole life on the line out there just because it's fun. She needs attention, right? That's what the cynics say. That's what the people who have joined them say. So what happens is after your immune system gets knocked down, what happens when your immune system gets knocked down? You catch what's going around, that's all. It's not like they're injecting flu in the sky. It's just, you know, technically they could. Probably encapsulate it in some fiber and you breathe it, you melt the fiber, you catch whatever's in there. Maybe. But you don't have to. You just catch whatever's going around. Look at all the people that have slaved in coal mines over the years, back before machines were doing most of what, you know, the, you know, machines do now what the men used to do personally. They had black lung. And they got sick constantly. They live in a constant state of sickness because of it. The sacs in their lungs are covered in soot. Even though they might wear a a mask in the more recent century, it's still all around them constantly, and they get sick. It's from the law of particulates, but they're breathing coal dust and dust dust and everything else that's down there. It's bad for you. So we're in this big green movement in the world, right? We're in this big movement where it's like clean up all the, uh, the carbon in the sky. Hey. I kind of dig that personally. I don't like being attached to global warming, but hey, we should go to every single plant in third world countries especially and say that black shit coming out of that smokestack has got to stop. Otherwise, we're going to stop it for you, right? But if that's an objective of mankind, which is a noble one, then why would we allow planes to make clouds, to spray anything out of the back, any anomaly, especially at low altitudes, 
that could drift down on the people. And this goes to the geoengineering program that's been announced. When asked 10 years ago at the conference in San Diego, the geoengineering conference in San Diego, what do you think that the, uh, has, have there been any tests done to say what aluminum oxide would do to the population? They said they hadn't researched it yet. Dr. Russell Blaylock, retired neurosurgeon, said, I'll tell you exactly what it does. It goes up into your nose, goes right through your blood-brain barrier, and hosts itself in your brain. And we all know that Alzheimer's and dementia patients have aluminum accumulation in the brain. Again, when you grow up in a big city, you may or may not get the lineage of your people in conversation because there's too many people, there's too much renewal, there's too much turnover, there's too many transient people that you never can have a conversation about, hey, grandpa, tell me what the world was like 50 years ago. And tell me about your father and your grandfather. Let's go back 150 years. What was the world like back then? Luckily, your humble narrator grew up in a tiny little town for 12 years. And the heritage of our town is everywhere. It's in the architecture. It's in the businesses. It's in the uh, educational system. It is what you go and, and listen to. You know, I used to carve wood with my grandfather. And we'd sit in this room with guys from fucking 90 years old all the way down to 12 years old. All whittling away wood and talking about the town 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and what people died of and what they didn't die of. And I will tell you right now, in my personal history with my hometown, the first case of Alzheimer's that ever showed up was in 1986. 85, 86. But what else also debuted into the world about five years earlier? Aluminum cans. Aluminum became this big recyclable thing. You know, I happen to be part of a family that had, uh, you know, my great-great-grandfather lived 101 and his father lived to be 104. So where, where most families would have a new generation every 15 to 20 years, because people started having kids around 15 back in the day, my family went 205 years with just two gentlemen. And so I get to have the information about those individuals because one of them was fairly celebrated because he was so old and he was part of the Civil War. He did two tours in the Civil War. And so presidents would write him letters and he would get interviewed all the time. And so they constantly asked him, why, you know, what keeps you old? What, what's, what's been your health regimen? How many teeth have you lost? That kind of stuff, right? For the guy that lived to be 101, I think he lost one tooth when he was young during the Civil War. Well, what would be the regimen if he was transplanted to today? Well, get that fluoride in your system, the byproduct of fluorine that comes from making aluminum. Up until 19, uh, what is it, 49, it was considered one of the most toxic chemicals on planet Earth, but by 1955, it was in all of our fucking toothpaste. The funny thing that I, I just want to close on is this notion, when you find someone who's given up, what they're sort of a saying, when they, when they go through all the conspiracies of the world and they just throw kind of lowbrow, you know, ankle-deep research on every topic and they try to say, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. It's all official story stuff, right? Is that What they're saying is, is that the world is pretty much perfect. And that's an, it's kind of an absurd adjective, but the idea is, They've got an excuse for everything and making an official story. And I guarantee you the reason why they've gone this route is it lets them sleep at night. That's why. And again, that's why I always stress on this show, if you're doing research and you're evangelizing some of the darkness, you're going to need a break. You will, because you're just going to get overwhelmed, perhaps with the negativity or how you interpret it. It's not a feeling you want to have. It's not a thought you want to have. So just take a break. But don't, I mean, this is, my, this is my advice. My advice is don't join them. And especially don't go out and whitewash it. Now I'm going to use a fictional example of where being a teacher or being anyone that passes information along is a very dangerous thing. And it's, it comes with the maximum amount of responsibility as a, as a human being that you could possibly have, which is the following. And I'm going to give you a fictional one. You're going to laugh, but just hang in there. Uh, Star Wars, the movie, fictional, sci-fi. Obi-Wan Kenobi, he trains Anakin Skywalker. Anakin fell and went to the dark side. 
He got enough information to be dangerous. He wasn't stabilized mentally and spiritually, and so he was able to be pulled away by the Emperor and becomes dark. And now the universe has to deal with Darth Vader. Here comes Luke Skywalker, an idealistic 17-year-old kid, learns about this villain and dedicates his whole life to getting rid of the darkness. And of course, there's the whole twist that they're related. The problem with whitewashing all this stuff, and, and you know, there's one thing to say, you're going to make a video where you're talking about, you're skeptical. You know, you were totally on board and now you figured out some other things and it seems like it makes sense and you're skeptical, right? And then there's one thing to say, it is definitely not what you think it is. It's all good and it's all great. When you become an educator of any kind and you see something go wrong, you've taught someone something and they took it the wrong way and they start going down a really dark path and in their brain they're not going down a dark path. It's a hell of a thing to be responsible for that catalyst of someone's life going dark. And, you know, part of the reason why, you know, I wanted to get rid of the MK Ultra Radio show was that we started off trying to expose as much as we possibly could. We got to the point where we exposed it all, and then we got into the current event stuff. And I thought that we just weren't doing enough research to really validate the episodes. And I didn't want to have any part of it because we're both too busy to really give it any quality. And so that's why I bring this show on board because it allowed us to go deeper into the subjects, represent both sides of the coin as much as possible, And sort of let you go off and do your own research. You should still do that with chemtrails, for sure. It is my personal belief, through all of the research that I just described in this episode, that I believe that they are unequivocally real. And it's just straight logic for how they spray their stuff, all the claims for the alternate theories of persistent contrails, the fact they don't teach pilots about uh, persistent contrails. I would imagine that today, honestly, those classes that uh, the guy I interviewed was a private pilot, talked about, they're probably adding persistent contrails to the curriculum at this point, I would imagine. But this guy was educated between 2000 and 2005, and he said it didn't exist. The theory was not communicated to pilots. And he said, look, if this stuff was at our level at 30,000 feet or above, he goes, they'd have to teach us because we'd be running into this shit, and it really fucks up visibility. He goes, when I was flying the G5 back from uh, South America, he goes, I had to change. I had to request permission to change my lane in in the air because I'm flying behind this goddamn plane. It's barfing out this, at night it's dark. When you hit this stuff, it's dark. And so he got permission to move out of the way, to change his corridor. I think most of you are really dedicated to your own research I really do believe that. You, if you've even clicked on this particular title, you're a person who is probably, I would imagine 90% of the people that click on this have already heard of chemtrails. You've already done your research. You may or may not have taken a bunch of photographs. You may or may not have done interviews on the ground with people that have, you know, again, thousands of hours of research and the education around this conversation. But for those of you who are brand new to it, you're, you're inquisitive, you're interested in it, again, go, go look up Russell Blaylock's videos on chemtrails because he's just a really solid resource for the truth, in my opinion. Nobody wants this stuff to be real. Nobody. Nobody's looking for a subscription to their fucking channel uh, in this camp for bringing you darkness. It's not fun. It's not fun to go out and think about this. If you want to see a pretty good gallery of chemtrail photographs, go to onepagenews.com. I believe the rightmost navigation is chemtrails. If you just mouse over it and click down, you'll see chemtrail gallery. And it has thousands of photographs in it from all around the world. And it'll start to sink in how big this program is. And some of you think, well, it can't be real because that's too big of a program. Believe me, I understand. I think they've had decades to, to rationalize whatever they're doing and to bring on the, uh, the, the dedicated you know, resources to make it happen. So the final question to, answer, uh, to attempt to answer is why. And again, I have an whole episode on the question why. 
The problem with the question why when it comes to chemtrails is we're not exactly sure. Why? It makes people sick. People get sick, they go to hospitals, they get injected full of a ton of stuff. I guarantee you the pharmaceutical industry, just the over-the-counter pharmaceutical industry, makes billions and billions a year from, from these trails being sprayed in the sky. Because everyone gets the cold, they get what they call the flu, the advanced cold. Again, if you're suffering from an ailment and you need your immune system to help fight the suffering and the infection or the cancer, okay, this stuff in the sky is making it more difficult for you to fight whatever you have. So if you're trying to get out of stage four cancer, or stage three cancer or something, and you're breathing this shit, it ain't doing you any favors, trust me. So, so now there's two sides of this coin at this point. There's the conspiracy that's been going on in, on YouTube for 20 years, 97 to 2017, 20 years, people have been trying to expose chemtrails, keep getting told that they don't exist. Now we have it in the public press that they are now green lighting this global warming shield. So you can expect never to see the trail sprayed for the global warming shield because it, it will not be sprayed below 40,000 feet because anything below 40,000 feet is going to land on our head, isn't it? So they got to spray really high. So you shouldn't see any of this stuff if they do it. But have they done any due diligence on what the chemicals that they choose to spray up there are going to do to humanity when it finally lands in our lungs? I don't have any, uh, any evidence whatsoever that they've done any research. The only time the question was ever asked, to my knowledge, was in San Diego, place, same place they do Comic-Con down there, and the geoengineer showed up and said they were going to spray aluminum oxide in the sky to protect us against global warming. And they were asked, have you done any due diligence on what this does to human beings? They said, not yet. So we should be able to find that research, right? Someone has to contest Dr. Bla Russell Blaylock's personal investigation and personal medical knowledge about how it's going to go up into our brains. If, if Alzheimer's has an accumulation of aluminum, which has been the, the evidence since 1985, my physics teacher taught it in high school, uh, Alzheimer's that is, and the aluminum accumulation in the brain, then you shouldn't be allowed to spray the stuff in the sky, should you? Just that simple. Just that simple. So I'll leave it up to you. But, you know, I, I really just hate to see someone get out there and whitewash the whole thing. And do it so fucking matter of fact, man. Just, just they don't worry about it. And they're fucking stupid. And I read Wikipedia. And motherfucker, I have all the news on planet Earth now. I've got all the science I need to know. All right? You're just like, you know, one step from going to a bathhouse with fucking Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson at that point. On that note, I think you feel me. I think that's it. DeepThoughtsRadio.com for all the feeds. There's video if you're coming on audio, audio if you're coming on video. It is on iTunes as well. Uh, again, if you want to watch season one in its pristine, perfect quality, go to vid.me in your web browser. Look for Deep Thoughts Radio. It's in the uh, brain food category. Uh, again, I've got a special agreement with them to let me put these really long episodes because you don't usually have the capability of posting um, anything over about 15 minutes without their permission. They've been really great to me to allow me to do that. It is not as up-to-date as the YouTube channel because uh, I want to keep YouTube being the, uh, the primary way to ingest the content. So I think it's a superior service with great comments and stuff. There's a Patreon account for those of you who are interested in contributing. Um, I'm going to be posting stuff into the Patreon account. I forgot that I need to fill that up with a bunch of episodes and that sort of thing. I am going to create some reward packages for Patreon. I finally figured out kind of what I can do. So there might be some situations where a uh, either a one-time donation um, might get... Uh, we could do some Skype sessions personally for a particular amount. And... Um, I think that might be kind of fun. Anyway, take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.